As many of you know, Slow Food USA unites the joy of food with the pursuit of justice. We cultivate national programs in a network of local chapters, host educational events, and advocacy campaigns, and build solidarity through partnerships. Together, we are dismantling oppressive food systems to achieve good, clean, and fair food for all. The Food and Farm Policy Steering Committee is a group of slow food leaders interested in the role that policy plays in shaping our food and farm system. Our goal is to position slow food as a leading voice in important food and farm policy debates and to get more individuals and communities engaged in policy. These conversations are a part of an effort we and we periodically hold in-person and virtual events to highlight active areas, active areas of policy debate. I will be your moderator this evening. I'm Erin Kelly, the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator for Slow Food USA. My role is to provide education about current food and farm legislation in a transparent and meaningful way, as it directly impacts the welfare of every citizen. As I was torn between the medical and legal sectors as both need so much advocacy, I pursued a health coaching path through Duke and integrative medicine, as well as a legal um, career focused on food policy and child advocacy. And before joining the Slow Food team, I worked in every sector of food, from a farmer to a garden culinary educator to a restaurateur. But more importantly are our panelists this evening, who I will introduce you to very shortly. First, I want to discuss why policy is so important. The US Congress makes laws that influence many aspects of our daily life. Being informed about those policies that directly impact our lives helps us make informed decisions on when we go to vote. Slow Food USA used to promote vote with your fork and now we vote with your vote. Tonight, discussing the BIPOC and beginning farmers farm bill, I wanna provide a brief history to help everyone understand for nearly a century, structural inequality and racial discrimination in agriculture has created de facto exclusion of Black and Native American farmers and ranchers from across, from access to federal agricultural assistance programs. And laws that preyed upon the economically disadvantaged have reduced the number of Black farmers in the U.S. from nearly 1 million in 1920 to fewer than 50,000 today. Beginning farmers and ranchers, particularly those of color, face daunting financial and technical obstacles to farm and ranch ownership, operational success, and financial viability. Tonight, we have an incredible panel who will discuss the effectiveness of existing programs and focus on BIPOC and beginning farmer issues of equity and inclusion that must be addressed in the next farm bill if we are to finally achieve a food chain that is good, clean, and fair for all including all the farmers and ranchers who work to feed us now and in the future. This panel will consider the successes and failures of past legal action, legislation, executive action, and existing programs and the opportunities afforded by future legislation. Our goal tonight is to educate slow food supporters and engage them in policy advocacy in support of a farm bill that is fair to all producers. I want each of you to welcome all of our panelists Tonight, we have Vanessa Polanco, who is the Federal Policy Director at National Young Farmers Coalition. Vanessa is an immigrant from the Dominican Republic, and she brings her identities and experiences to shape her advocacy and research activities. Vanessa is a graduate from Michigan State University and the University of Rhode Island. She has worked with Food Solutions New England, MSU Center for Regional Food Systems, and with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Next, we have Darnella Burkett Winston, who is the project director for the Mississippi Association of Cooperatives, a state association of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund. She has led Max Farm to School and Project Healthier Mississippi initiatives. She is also a recipient of the 2019 Gus Schumacher Award. Darnella is the fourth generation farmer, manager of BMB Farms in Petal, Mississippi, and she works alongside her father, legendary farmer and activist, Ben Burkett. The land that they farm has been in the family since 1889, when her great-grandfather acquired a 164-acre homestead. Darnella is also the mother of a vibrant, intelligent six-year-old daughter, Denver. She loves to see her mom in action, 
and will be and be with her grandfather on the farm. And next we have Adam Zipkin, who is counsel to Senator Cory Booker. In this role, Adam advises Senator Booker on issues related to food policy, agriculture, and animal welfare. Before his employment in the Senate, Adam was deputy mayor for economic development for the city of Newark, New Jersey. Prior to working in City Hall, Adam operated a law office primarily devoted to providing pro bono legal services to Newark residents in need, with a focus on providing representation to low income tenants. In 2006, Adam received the Pro Bono Attorney of the Year Award from the Essex County Legal Services Volunteer Lawyers for Justice Program in recognition of his service and dedication to meeting the legal needs of indigenous persons. Welcome all. Now it is time for you all to take the stage and have an amazing discussion tonight. Adam, I'm going to start with you. To help us open this conversation up, could you please explain what the Farm Bill is and what the impact it has on farmers? Well, thank you so much, Erin, for that kind introduction and for uh, including me on the panel. And, you know, the Farm Bill is really um, something that's unique in the legislation that is um, passed here in Washington, D.C. It is um, a bill that is roughly every five years reauthorized, and it really covers every aspect of farming. So all of our programs that are there that impact farmers that are um, in, in, in law to help farmers. So if it's the um, assistance programs that they need, if there are disasters or if there are any types of um, impacts on prices that would um, have too severe of an economic impact on farmers. Those types of subsidy programs are in there. Conservation funding is in there. Funding for um, credit and lending programs. So really the whole sort of safety net for farmers that has developed over the course of 100 years and has you know sort of evolved and changed over time gets reauthorized every five years and gets debated in Congress and ultimately um, with a lot of input from farmers and organizations representing farmers, then sets the stage for what the next bunch of years will be like in terms of um, the, the assistance from Washington that's there for farmers. Thank you. Um, Darnella, I want to go to you and ask, as someone who runs a small farm, how are you and other small farms affected by these policies in the Farm Bill um, as they tend to award more funding to large scale farms over small scale BIPOC farmers? Okay, thank you. Um, being a small scale farmer and being able to get the information or up to the Congress and to the House where it needs to be for us to be heard has been challenging. You know, being able to, to find organizations to work with to, to let them know what it is that the small farmer is facing on the farm, a beginning farmer, a BIPOC farmer, being able to come into agriculture as a new face, even though you could have a generation behind you, but being able to, to have a part to tell what it is that you like to see, you know, in this generation, in this era of farmer. And it's important to try to get that information to be able to be included in the farm bill. Thank you, Darnella. Vanessa, and how does this affect young farmers, beginning farmers? Sure. So I think we have a really unique problem that many young farmers, especially the young farmers that we represent in National Young Farmers Coalition, they are now multi-generational farmers. They are now Darnella. They are people that were removed from their farms two or three generations ago, and now they're reclaiming and returning to agriculture. So a lot of them don't have a history with USDA. So a lot of them don't even know what USDA programs are accessible to them, or maybe they never heard about the Farm Bill. So there's also a specific programs on the farm bill that we're really excited that actually support young farmers and farmers of color to apply for all the other farm bill programs uh, that they, they, they have the right to apply, but many of them are not eligible because of their operation size or, or the kind of 
production that they have because most young farmers are growing diversified vegetable production they're not growing one single commodity on 600 acres so we need to be thinking about how the farm bill can be working better for young farmers and is increasing access to a lot of the pre-existing uh, farm bill programs thank you um adam you know hearing both darnella and vanessa's um viewpoint what are you seeing as the big wins in the next farm bill that will address their specific needs yeah so let me let me take a step back um you know i think there's been a lot of um uh surprise from from people that a senator from new jersey wanted to join the senate agriculture committee a lot of times you see more senators from um, the Midwest and senators from states that grow the big commodity crops. So a lot of corn and a lot of soy. And for Senator Booker, he was mayor of Newark and I was with him, as you mentioned. And one of the things that we saw in Newark was that big parts of the city were food deserts, right? A lot of communities in Newark don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And that was sort of our introduction to the food system. And we saw how it really was not serving well the residents of Newark. Then when we came to the Senate, Senator Booker met with farmers in New Jersey and he traveled and met with farmers all over the country. And we sort of were able to see that the same broken food system in Newark really was failing all of us. It was not working for farmers and ranchers who were being sort of squeezed on all sides by the consolidation that's been happening in the farm industry. There's, you know, what we've seen over the course of the last 100 years, but even 50 years and 20 years is just um, a lot of farmers being driven out of business and this sort of policy that got put into effect back in starting in like the 1970s of sort of get bigger, get out and planting fence row to fence row. And so what one thing that I think we can learn is that federal policies really matter, right? When, when the federal government started having a vision for a system of get bigger, get out, and, and providing incentives primarily to certain commodity crops and to and to bigger and bigger farmers. You know, we now end up with the food system that we have now, where there's just a lot of small and mid-sized farmers in crisis, right? And we see really high suicide rates and bankruptcy rates. And, and so there's a lot of work that we need to do. And I think Senator Booker realized that so many issues that he cares about, environmental issues climate issues, racial justice issues, they're all sort of tied back to our food system and the need to make reforms in our food system. And so over the last several years, Senator Booker has introduced several bills that I think we're hoping in you know, whole or in part, we can work into the farm bill conversation. And so I'll give a few examples. One was the Climate Stewardship Act, which was focused on investing in farmers and ranchers as part of the solution to climate change using existing voluntary conservation programs to, um, to give farmers the resources in a targeted way to, to um, transition to the types of regenerative agriculture practices that we know are not just beneficial from a climate change perspective. They don't just, healthy soil doesn't just sequester more soil, more carbon, but it also makes farms and rural communities more resilient. It makes you know, protects our drinking water, creates wildlife habitat. And so, so in the Build Back Better bill that's pending in Washington right now, there's tens of billions of dollars that are really sort of um, what we had drafted in the Climate Stewardship Act of investing in farmers and ranchers as part of the solution to climate change. And so I think one thing we'll be looking to do, uh, so we need to get that bill passed this month, but then I think in the farm bill, we'll be looking to build on that and to protect those dollars to make sure that they don't get taken and, and used for other things. And so I think sort of investing in farmers and ranchers and making sure that those dollars are going to beginning farmers and farmers of color and that they have access to these conservation programs in, in, um, in ways that they haven't always. And so I think that's one sort of pr priority for us. Another bill that the Senator introduced was the Farm System Reform Act, which is focused on really trying to fix aspects of this broken system. Senator Booker and I traveled and went to Duplin County, North Carolina and saw these big factory farms and how primarily low-income communities and communities of color that live near these factory farms, right? They have these massive manure lagoons and they're spraying the waste and um, 
drifting into adjacent properties where you have people who have all kinds of health problems from that. And so trying to transition the, what the bill would do, one of the things it would do is it would put a moratorium on new large factory farms and phase out large factory farms over time. It would create a pot of money to transition farmers that want to get out of that system into more regenerative agriculture. And it would make reforms to the Packers and Stockyards Act so that sort of leveling the playing field for small and mid-sized farmers and contract farmers against these really big consolidated companies that have sort of got a stranglehold on our um, food system now. And so I think getting some of those, we're, we know we're not going to get all of that at all in the next farm bill, but getting pieces of that starting to make, and I, and I think one thing I'll say about the farm bill is you make incremental progress. Like at the end of the day, this Build Back Better bill that we're passing in Washington now that's going to clear the Senate with 50 votes, so it'll be only Democrats that are needed to kind of coalesce around what the policy is. But for the farm bill, we need 60 votes in the Senate. Everything has to be bipartisan. There's really a history of bipartisanship on the Senate Agriculture Committee and the House Agriculture Committee. And so we need to build bipartisan support and just make progress on things. And so I think on the Climate Smart Ag, on sort of some of the systems reforms to create more transparency to create a more level playing field to re to reduce some of the concentration in the system and then another bill that I'll I'll mention and then I'll I'll let others chime in um, is the Justice for Black Farmers Act that Senator Booker originally introduced last Congress and reintroduced this Congress that would address what you mentioned this just terrible history of discrimination at USDA against black farmers where We've gone from almost a million black farmers a century ago to less than 50,000 today. And, and, and those black farmers, those black families have lost somewhere between 15 and 20 million acres of land, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of generational wealth that was taken from them because they were denied access to these programs that we're talking about that are in the farm bill, this safety net that was really there for white farmers that just wasn't there very intentionally for black farmers and indigenous farmers and, and others. And so, so, so that bill does a bunch of things. It would um, put reforms in place at USDA to try to once and for all just end the discrimination that we know still unfortunately is, is going on today. It would create a land grant program to try to restore some of that land base that's been lost by black farmers. It would do things like provide debt forgiveness for um, some of the current USDA um, black borrowers and, and other uh, socially disadvantaged borrowers. And, and, and so some of those things, again, we're going to be able to do in this Build Back Better bill. And so, so there was debt forgiveness that Congress passed a few months ago that's been blocked by the courts. I think you'll see that that's going to get fixed in this next bill, and it will provide debt forgiveness not just to black farmers and indigenous farmers and other socially disadvantaged farmers, but sort of all of the small economically disadvantaged borrowers that currently have loans um, with the FSA, with USDA, will get that debt forgiveness done, will create an equity commission, will provide funding for technical assistance and for dealing with some of the issues that have um, plagued not just black farmers, but disproportionately black farmers around um, land ownership and heirs property issues. So, so we'll get some of those things done, hopefully, if we pass this bill, the uh, President Biden's Build Back Better bill this month, but then we'll have more work to do. The pieces of the Justice for Black Farmers Act that we don't get done in the uh, bill this month, we'll be looking ahead to the farm bill because really what, you know, the for better or for worse, most of the legislating in the agriculture and farm space happens in the farm bill. You just don't see very many big bills getting done in the years between the farm bill. And so everyone kind of works on bringing everything to the table. And, and Senator Booker will definitely have sort of an ambitious list that we will work with, um, you know, the outside groups to um, to try to uh, coalesce around that will be trying to be a voice for young farmers, beginning farmers, farmers of color at the table um, to push for their priorities. 
Thank you so much for that very thorough explanation, Adam. Um, and before I open up another question, I wanted to reach out to Darnella and Vanessa, if you had any questions directly to Adam about anything he just said. I do. Um, just for information, as, as a small farmer in the rural that have things that I would possibly want to talk about that could be in the farm bill, who would you advise I reach out to um, to be able to get some of those actions heard? It, um, so that's a good question. I mean, I think every I think farmers in general, to the extent that they can try to build a relationship with their member of Congress, right? Who, wherever their farm is, whatever district, whether their um, member of Congress is a Republican or a Democrat, sort of trying to open a line of communication with their Congress member and then with their senators as well. And then I think for our office, for Senator Booker, we would sort of welcome, you know, input from, from farmers around the country. We're looking to, we recognize we still have a lot to learn. There's so many complicated issues with a long history that we don't pretend that we have all the answers. And so we love hearing from farmers. And, and I think we'll probably, as I mentioned before, the Senator had sort of traveled in, he went and visited farmers in um, Illinois, in Missouri, in Kansas. I think we'll probably try to go to the South and visit farmers in, in some other states as well, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. Darnella, what I can tell you is you can talk to people like me, people who have a very direct connection to people like Adam, if you don't know Adam. So also our organizations like mine, we're really good at talking to farmers because you guys are too busy, you do too many things. You don't have time to maybe fly, fly down to Washington DC or just popping up Zoom call. But if you talk to our organizers, to our people, that information gets related to me in that, and I relate that information to the offices to the Senate and House Agricultural Committees. Um, and the time is now. Um, we are really in full farm bill um, implementation planning move at Young Farmers. It's never, it, I know I will we'll tell you more about the timeline later, but it's never too early to start thinking about the farm bill changes. We keep just, we keep up posted uh, in our desk all the time. You're like, this is we want to change in the farm bill. As, and just, we keep writing on them as they come up because we are always in our mind and we're always hearing about them from our members. So when we start planning and thinking more about changes in implementation, we have a full list ready. And also, it's not also about, it's the process of revision of the farm bill. Uh, every, every five years, we have an opportunity to revise things, to add things, to change things. So it's not everything set on a stone. We can always revise things after like a, a trial period of four years. I wanted to follow up with you, Vanessa. Um, you mentioned that uh, National Young Farmers is already in the planning process. Can you explain what Young Farmers is doing to plan for this farm bill and the work that you're doing and how other young farmers and even the public can support you and get behind this? Definitely, thank you. So a lot of planning is, uh, really detailed. Like we start thinking a lot about ahead of time, what went right on the last farm bill? What was still missing? What is missing in the farm bill that we had never done before in the almost a hundred, uh, over a hundred years of the other piece of legislation. So we actually started planning a year, a year ago, basically. And we start identifying priorities. We start meeting with farmers. We do research on it and we find uh, sponsors for it. So actually three weeks ago, we launched our biggest um, priority for the next farm bill and it's gonna be land access for young farmers. So if you visit youngfarmers.org uh, slash land, you're gonna be reading our policy recommendations already for the next farm bill uh, on land access. When we started having meetings, we, in, we members of Congress and we USDA and we partner organizations. Do you think these are the right recommendations? Do you think uh, how bold should we be in asking for more support for land tenure for young farmers and farmers of color. But as an organization, we also do more detailed process. We have a federal policy committee that is elected by our members. And starting next month, I'm gonna be meeting with them every month for the next two years until the farm bill passes, asking them really specific farm bill questions about every possible program that can serve a young farmer. So we do a lot of that, what we call feedback process and accountability process when we gather feedback from also from our national members nationwide. We're gonna be la launching a national survey. 
So we can always validate the things that we're hearing from one or two farmers compared to a thousand farmers. And we can bring that feedback, that validation to congressional offices when we're meeting with them and telling our young farmer stories about what are things needed in, in the Farm Bill. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, Darnella, on that note, what is, what is your feedback? What is it that you wanna see in this Farm Bill? I'm just giving a, a, a platform for the small farmer not to be in the category with the large farmer when it comes to uh, certain programs that USDA have. Um, I shouldn't have to be ranked or, or put up with competition um, against a larger farmer and we're in the same county or the same parish. Uh, being able to, to get in there as a beginning farmer, a BIPOC farmer, and knowing what it is that I would have to do, but yet there's somebody who has been already there and, and has a system of always being funded on that level of it is that the program that the office, particular office may have, I think there should be a split in those categories as if right now it's saying, if you haven't farmed, I believe within 10 years, you're considered a beginning farmer. Well, if I'm going in as a beginning farmer, then there should be a program that helps me to get started instead of putting me in that same category as that farmer that's been farming 30 years to be able to receive government funds or to be able to get conservation practices on my land. So that is something that I would like to, you know, work with not being in the same category. And Darnella, what are you doing now to make up for the inadequacies in the legislation? What are you doing so to support you and your other farmers? Um, using co-op, doing a co-op movement, um, being able to, to work cooperatively in, uh, in an agriculture co-op. Um, also being able to have mentors that, that has been a part of not being receiving funds or receiving practices from USDA and how did you continue um, farming? How did you continue to stay in the struggle? But at the same time, it also sits in my mind as this beginning farming that, okay, I need to take what it is that they're doing and incorporate it into my practices, but yet still use that platform that's out there that's supposed to be for everyone to use, no matter what it is, who you are, you know, it's just for everyone to be able to use and it hasn't been that way. So being able to have alternative ways to be able to stay in agriculture and compete to have a market to be in. Adam, do you have anything to share with Darnella about what the legislation side is planning to do to support the different categories? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, we are, and we sort of, I think Senator Booker's office, but also like the Senate and House Agriculture Committees, I think like once 2022 starts, once we get through this month and a bunch of the big sort of legislative priorities that are on um, the Senate's plate, I think there will be a pivot to the next Farm Bill, which, you know, the current Farm Bill expires September 30th, 2023. So we have a little less than two years. And so I think what we need to be doing now is hearing about the priorities and hearing about the problems and then coming up with the solutions and working with the advocates. And so I don't have specific answers at this moment of sort of like what I think might be in the next bill. I think we need to be coming up with a list and it's gonna be a really long list of like all the issues that we wanna try to make an impact on and sort of put improvements in place in these policies to better serve small farmers and farmers of color and um, young farmers. And so I think um, the, the, the best answer I could give right now is that um, I almost in some ways feel like this webinar is really sort of kicking off the process for me and for my office to sort of be really starting to now look ahead to the next farm bill. And I think that next year you'll see hearings and bills introduced and, and we need to come up with good solutions to, to these issues that are being raised because there's a lot of farmers out there right now that are just barely sort of hanging on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and something you know, we all know legislation moves really slow <laughs> and we all dream really big, uh, but we do need to have 
some realistic um, kind of, you know, hopes. And Adam, you know, I, what is the reality? Like when you say we can hope for like incremental changes and incremental um, progress here, what is what is the reality of that? Yeah, so I, I kind of think that um, as we approach the farm bill, we need to have sort of two buckets. One being like, what's the food system that we want to? So, so taking a step back, you know, when I was in Newark in city government, right? There was just there was a sense of urgency of like we had to get everything done now, now, now. And it was just like you couldn't really be looking too far ahead. Having come to Congress and the Senate and D.C. and seeing how things work here, you really have to be able to take the long view, right? You have to. So I think what one thing we have to be approaching this farm bill with is a sense of what's the farm system what's the what's the federal safety net what's the federal programs that in our perfect world we want to see in place 10 or 15 or 20 years from now and how can we sort of take steps towards building that so i think that's like one bucket is like what's our long-term goals and how can we make progress towards them then i think we have to have another bucket which is just there's a lot of problems that can't wait, that need solutions now, that farmers like just really, really need our help. And so, and that bucket is gonna have so many things in it, right? There's just so many aspects to the system that could be improved upon. And I think that that's really where we're gonna be both coming up with our lists in our Senate office, but also wanting to just hear from the advocates who are on the ground, who, like Vanessa said, the groups that are working with the farmers themselves that could come and tell us, like, here's what's happening right now. And here's, at a minimum, what's needed to try to, you know, address this particular injustice or this particular injustice. And so I think that will be what we're, you know, kind of uh, spending a lot of hours doing in the coming months. Thank you. Um, Darnella, I, I feel like you, know, you are the farmer on the ground and you have been waiting on legislation. And so you've created these co-op you know, structures to meet some of the needs of your community. What are some realistic, immediate things that you want to see from this farm bill? You, you're on, you have the platform this evening to ask and to say, this is what we need. It looks like you're muted. So some of the things of, if I heard it, I believe I was froze for a moment or two before I was able to, to unmute, unmute it. But could you repeat it, Aaron? Yeah, um, I, I was saying, you know, as a farmer who's on the ground and who's doing the work and who has already, you know, because, you know, you can't wait for legislation to go through to make act, direct action in your community. And so you've created these co-op structures to fill some of these gaps um, while you have this platform. And while we know that there is a lot in that bucket of things that we want, but we aren't necessarily guaranteed, what are some of the things that you can say that your community and you as a farmer need immediately? You know, and what what is a and what is a realistic thing that you feel like legislation can give to the small farmers, to the BIPOC farmers, sooner than later? I I believe as um, I kind of stated, you know, just being in a category and being in that pool of of competition, um, not even with just farmers, but even with uh, corporate farmers or corporate business, you know, being in a part of a, a cooperative and those are groups of small farmers, you know, trying to, to get a better val value or to get a better price just for, for our products. But yet when we have to be put in the same circle as large corporate farming and, and, and businesses, it just, it's just not fair um, all the way down to, to insurance uh, being able to have the same capacity of a corporate company versus a small farmer, uh, that is, that's something that I think that could happen very quickly. Uh, being able to categorize, you know, certain criterias for farmers to be in. 
uh, not being able to, to use the system as in I can, I've been here the longest or my, my farm is, is bringing, I don't know, the America 2 million while my farm is, is only bringing American, you know, 500,000, but yet I'm feeling I live in and be able to create jobs locally, able to not be put in the same category would be something that, that could actually help and do pretty quickly. So categories is the biggest immediate solution. And I know it's Adam, you can't tell us on the spot if that's something that you can do. <laughs> well, I think I think there's a lot of things. You know, I think right now, um, I think what we need to do is just look at where are incentives going and what are we incentivizing, right? And so less than two, so, so on the one hand, we have, you know, our dietary guidelines saying that our diets should be comprised primarily of fruits and vegetables, right? That should be the majority of our diet, but less than 2% of our federal subsidies go to specialty crops, go to fruits and vegetables, right? So I think like aligning where our federal dollars are going to the type of system that we want to create. And I think what we saw during COVID is the current system, because it's so concentrated and because it's gotten so big in place, that's really brittle, right? And like, so it broke down because of some of the shocks to the system, but really where we saw a lot of resiliency was our local regional food systems where the farmers were able to, you know, if, if they for a little while couldn't do the farmer's markets, then they pivoted and they did sort of direct sales to consumers and they found other ways to sort of get the food to, that they were growing to the, um, to the people that were in need of the food, whereas other parts of the system that were too big, all of a sudden you had um, COVID outbreaks in the meatpacking plants and farmers having to kill their animals or plow over their crops, at, right? So there was just big sort of breakdown. So I think investing in local regional food systems, making sure that our crop insurance programs, that the, the subsidy structure and the premiums and, and that they're targeted to um, and serving best and prioritizing, you know, farmers like Darnella that, you know, have been sort of, um, excluded or marginalized from either the programs themselves or from the incentive structures for the um, insurance companies that are that are providing those those types of crop insurance and things. And so I think it's things like that where we can just look at each program and and like Darnella said, it's not it can't just be one size fits all, right? We have to make sure that. And, and I think w one thing that Senator Booker is starting the process now. The, in in Washington, in part of the federal government, there's um, an entity known as GAO who does these deep dive sort of studies looking into these questions that we're talking about, like what specific changes could you make to the crop insurance program or to some of the conservation that would better serve historically underserved farmers, small farmers, beginning farmers, farmers. And so hopefully we'll get back some in-depth reports that will tell us these are the specific sort of surgical changes that you could make to these programs to better incentivize local and regional food systems or to better um, uh, help the small farmers and beginning farmers. And following that from Adam, um, in my master's program, we used to say, you cannot, you cannot change what you have in measure. And that's what we really like uh, reporting and accountability coming from USDA. So we were really excited when in previous farm bill, especially in the 2018 farm bill, we asked for better reporting on how land ownership looks like in the United States. Uh, and that, and that uh, research has still not been implemented and we're getting ready for another farm bill. So we now don't have enough resources to provide better policy recommendations uh, about how land access and who owns land in the United States but we have seen a great media reporting about who really owns land in the United States. So one of the tools that we have with the Farm Bell is that we can, we don't have to implement a massive program right away. We can 
ask for a research, we can ask for a study, we can ask for a, we can ask for a pilot program first to see if that will help create the resilient food system that we want, because we know we want, we may not ask, we cannot move entire titles right away. We cannot change massive funding right away. Well, we can start seeing bright spots of hope that will help us understand and create a food system that we want. And for example, and great example from the last formula that we're really seeing implemented is the Office of Urban Agriculture inside USDA. That's something that we asked for many years. It was finally implemented. And despite the pandemic, it was it's being rolled out inside USDA. So little things like that give us hope about the kind of projects and programs that we can start at the farm bill that can be implemented. It can trickle down and implement through our food system, through our communities and farm communities across the country and build a food system that we want. Vanessa, I wanted to follow up with, you know, you mentioned you know, you are the kind of organization that a farmer like Darnella can go to, to get support. Do we see this farm bill providing that roadmap for small farmers? Because if you're a small farmer and you don't have time to do this research, you don't have time to advocate for yourself, you don't have time to create the platform, how do they know where to go and who's gonna actually best represent their interests? Well, as, as an organization, we try to do a lot of what we call place-based organ, organ, organizing. We have organizers around the country. We have chapters. We have uh, 50 chapters in 32 states. In those chapters, their models are really different. Some of them don't, don't get involved in federal policy, but all the chapters involved in peer-to-peer -peer support. And those chapter leaders report back to us in DC about what are the barriers to accessing farm bill uh, programs. And many other times, it's also not the other way around. It's not about us going to telling our go, telling our farmers these are the programs, or us telling USDA these are the farmers or programs need. So this is the other way around. A few years ago, USDA actually did a memorandum understanding with us for us to create better services uh, and materials for outreach for young farmers because USDA knew that they were that they're not serving enough young farmers they are not serving enough white folk farmers so with that memorandum understanding and that partnership we were able to show uh, a pocket book that explains a lot of the federal programs approved by the farm bill that are accessible to young farmers in a way that is more accessible to them because as we are many people are commenting on the chat we know that fsa offices the local county offices and not all USDA officials know how to deal with young farmers and farmers of color and their operation. From a long history of discrimination through cultural competency to many other uh, institutional barriers, we have a lot of that discrepancy on communicating the farm bill programs who actually making them accessible to young farmers. But my organization, we are not a technical assistance provider. Uh, we are a peer-to-peer -peer network. We are an advocacy organization, but we are not technical assistance providers. But if you are part of our chapters or you call one organizers, they can always connect you to your to the resources, uh, to USDA officials that can understand you and support you in your journey. But at the same time, we know that we need more of that pipeline. We need to be building a capacity for farmers to be in the front lines and advocating for themselves. Because I know I say I'm never being a farmer and the daughter of a farmer, and I will never go into farming because God bless you. I don't know how you all do it. My 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 role is to advocate for all of you, but you need to be telling me your complaints. You need to be yelling at me so I can yell on your behalf. So it's really important that you feel that you know that we exist and that you can count on us and that we will represent you. And they're having many beautiful days when a farmer which is out to one of my organizers or chapter leaders in the morning. I know about it by noon and by 3 p.m. their member of Congress knows it. And by the afternoon, they're calling, that member of Congress is calling the USDA office also yelling on their behalf. So it's knowing that we, the, the people like me exist, organizations like me exist, that you have allies in Congress like Adam uh, and, and Senator Booker who can advocate for you and are thinking about your interests as well. But you need to be part of the coalition. You need to be a member. You need to be part of the newsletter. You need to be following us on social media. And you can also serve. You can also step up and advocate for other young farmers and farmers like you. Um, one of the things that I get to do in my job is um, 
facilitate our, our farmer policy committee. That is 15 farmers who have regional and, and um, demographic diversity from across the country. And those 15 farmers are like my sounding board for any feedback that I may need, farm bill related, USDA related. If the Alan needs me to endorse a bill, I have to run it by then. So it's always having it's always having that mechanism and knowing that there are spaces for you where you can voice your opinions, that your opinions matter, and that you are part of this federal policy legislative process. We are not making this up, me and Adam, as we go through. We are definitely hearing directly from farmers all the time and from food and farming advocates, like many people on this phone call. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Um, Dardella, I wanna go to you um, as we start to get towards the end, before we go into all the questions, amazing questions that the, uh, the audience has been asking. Um, Vanessa makes it sound so easy. Just go to her and they will fight. And I feel like it may be a little more complicated than that. And I just wanna get some final feedback on what you feel is, you know, what, what, what is the problem that prevents you and every small farmer from being able to go directly to someone like Vanessa or someone like Adam and say, hey, here are the problems, we need help? Um, after being a small farmer for a while, you feel like your words are, are, are not important. So you, you become idle and just farm and, and try to do everything yourself um, and not depend uh, prior to history. Um, and it makes you just kind of stay into this small circle and said, okay, I'm just going to do what I can, but yet you still need to, I'm finding out you can't be by yourself. You can't do it alone. And when you have these organizations out there and some of them do listen, but they never follow back up. Some of them take what you're saying and then use it. And then it's no more, um, well, we're going to come back. And so the issue that I have and that others have, you know, being in rural Mississippi, okay, some of us as myself still on dial up and not being able to, to get into some of these organizations or, or get the words that what we're working with on the ground that needs to, to be heard. And so I just feel, you know, that technical assistance piece is very important um, for the farm bill, but then also to be able to support organizations um, like ours and, and Vanessa to be able to say, okay, this is what this is what's going on, you know, in these communities and these small farmers, even though they might just be feeding their state or their their 14 counties, this is the issue, some of the issues that they're having. So I think those conversation pieces, being able to reach out um, to everyone. I, um, which I know is very hard to tackle, but yet when you have a, a segment or a lead way, I try to, to put the conversation there or try to let it be known that we are here and we need some help and we would like for you know organizations to, to reach out to the small BIPOC farmer, but yet also have a awareness of, okay, this is something that we don't do. This is something that that that's known to to hurt my head. That that's hurted my ancestors. And not only that, but it comes along to okay. I'm giving you my information, and you've taken it, and then I don't hear any. I don't hear anything else from you. You come in and, and you listen to my stories, and and you listen to how I'm being struggled in the market in agriculture, and yet you take that and you reroute it and fixate those words to to help someone else. So it's our other farmers, other cooperatives. And so this has become a, a problem, not only, you know, that it, that it seems like it keeps going on and on and, and it's adopt, I'm adopting it and I shouldn't into, into my farming practices, but yet I'm trying to open up and then take in these organizations that say that they're there to help and not there to hurt that they're there to listen and be able to come into your communities or come onto your farm and help get better practices and your voices being heard. So just being able to have that and know that organizations out there exist to do that, I think would be uh, just the lead way to be able to start. Thank you so much, Darnella. Um, Adam, I'm gonna let you close up with our last question. Um, to kind of explain 
how can Congress be more approachable? How do these farmers reach out to you and know that their answers or their questions are going to be answered? Um, and with the timeline of this farm bill, when can farmers like Darnella, um, when can policy directors like Vanessa start seeing some of these changes? I know that was probably three questions in one, but I had to get it all yeah, in so there. I think, I think on, the, on the outreach, I think that, you know, one of the things that Senator Booker has really tried to do in some of the bills I mentioned earlier that he's introduced over the last couple of years is build a coalition of support that's not just, so we, so we have sort of um, some of the, the groups that represent farmers like Vanessa's group, the, you know, representing young farmers and beginning farmers, but in addition, and, and a bunch of state farmers unions and National Family Farm Coalition and Farm Aid, but then we also have environmental groups supporting the bills and environmental justice advocates and animal welfare groups, public health groups, labor organizations. So I think we're just trying to build a coalition and raise awareness, like really what ultimately Senator Booker at times has sort of said, which is not his original statement of change very often doesn't come from Washington, change comes to Washington, right? And I think in farm and ag policy, it's more true than anywhere else almost just because there's such big powerful interests and lobbies that really want to keep the status quo right and so i think what we'll be spending a lot of time on is just educating people and trying to build awareness and so i think it, it's it seems to us and it it feels like there's just a growing movement in our country for change and so i think sort of for all of us to just take part in that right and try to help grow that movement is is a way to try to ultimately get the kind of food system that we all want to get. And then I think it, to your question of um, sort of when can farmers start to see some of the changes from the legislation, I think, you know, what, what hopefully the Senate will pass later this month, the president's bill back better, you know, $2 trillion um, uh, bill I think farmers will see debt forgiveness. Farmers will see conservation fund pretty quickly. Like I think those dollars, there'll be more nutrition funding. Some of the COVID programs that have been really, I think, you know, uh, saving a lot of families who otherwise would not have had access to food and would have had, you know, a lot more people going to bed hungry at night. So I think I think we'll be prioritizing sort of getting dollars out the door quickly when we pass these bills. But I think. You know, we have our work cut out for us to to build bipartisan support for for the type of farm bill that we want in 2023. Thank you, um, panelists. Any final word before we go into questions from the audience? Okay. Thank you for that, Adam, um, and thank you all for this amazing opportunity to discuss all these critical issues and I appreciate each of you and all the work that you do. Um, but I'm now gonna pass it off to my colleague, Dan Miller. Uh, this is gonna be Slow Food USA's equity, inclusion and justice strategist. And she's going to facilitate audience questions. So for everyone who's watching, if you haven't typed your question into the chat, please do so now. There's real, some really great ones in there. And I really appreciated my time with you all tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. As Aaron mentioned, my name is Dan Miller and I'm the EIJ strategist for Slow Food USA. Um, my role is really to support Slow Food USA national office and our broader network in using a lens of anti-racism and decolonization to mobilize our community of practice around the values of solidarity and liberation. It looks a lot like consulting with leaders and chapters on advancing an EIJ agenda and helping restructure our organization to be more accessible to all eaters, growers, and celebrators of food. I'm really happy to be here to facilitate this portion of the panel. I know I've certainly learned a lot and enjoyed being a part of the conversation. And I'd like to start with a couple questions from the audience. Um, uh, we had, at first, I think maybe just if someone can provide a point of clarity, we had a couple folks in the chat mention FSA county committees. Um, can someone go ahead and break that down, define what it is for our audience and explain what they do? 
Darnell, I want to give you the option before I do. I don't know if he, you, uh, you want to do that. Okay. Um, well, the FSA County Committee is, is the committee that's in the area of Farm Service Agency where they sent out, well, you have to be a farmer registered. Let me say, let me say that. Um, you have to have your farm number and, you know, be a part of um, USDA uh, Farm Service Community for, for nomination to, to come in. Uh, which I've learned apart, even though I've had a family member to serve on there, which I might not be the best candidate to speak about Farm Service Agency and this county committee. It's it's basically a, in, in my area is an inside piece to where you keep in the dollars where you can kind of tell where they're going to be in F, in. Uh, the county committee, but it's always good if you can have somebody on there to advocate for you um, to keep those dollars in the community for the farm for the farm service agency uh, committee. But it's it's actually um, a, a committee that ranks and be able to to advocate to get money in the area that does not tend to make it to my. Yeah. It does not seem to make it to, to my community or to my BIPOC families. Okay. Thank you, Darnella. I wanted to give you the option because you probably interact with them more. Than I'm happy to supplement that by saying Farm Service Agency is uh, an agency inside the Department of Agriculture that is especially tasked with helping, uh, uh, providing farmers with long and other financial resources. Uh, every state has a, um, an office and every county has an office. And the state office provide, there's a state committee that provides leadership at the state level to the state director that is appointed by the president. And that trickles down the money that is allocated federally at the state, at the county level. And there's a committee that is uh, elected by the fellow farmers and that, that committee reviews applications and reviews loans and reviews uh, other requests from farmers in that county. And those farmers approve or deny or allocate funds this, uh, to their discretion. And, and all them, it's, a, it's an elective position. And, and the one thing I'll add to that is just that, you know, in some ways, the county committee system can be really good. Like you have your neighbors, right? Your your fellow farmers in your county sort of there to help you if you need to come in for a loan or, or assistance with one of the programs. And so in some parts of the country, I think, and you know, during different time periods, the system has worked really well. In other parts of the country where there was still, you know, where, where there was a lot of discrimination against black farmers, against indigenous farmers in those communities, it would sort of, you know, the, the county committee system was not immune to that discrimination. And so I think a, a lot of the sort of history of discrimination that we've seen at USDA against Black farmers, against Indigenous farmers and others, a lot of it has been at the county committee level. And, and I think that's something that as USDA right now sort of goes through this process, creating an equity commission and trying to really do everything it can to sort of once and for all root out racism from their programs and policies and offices, I think the county committees are going to be a challenging area to, to figure out how to deal with in some parts of the country. Thanks for that discourse, which kind of leads us to our next question. One of our participants, Charity, was wondering if you all had any specific ideas on how to end the barriers caused by racism and local FSA officials who are usually white in favor, they're white friends and neighbors. It's a, it's a big one. Um, Adam, you sort of started to go there. I don't know if you have any additional ideas. Yeah, so I, I think that, um, you know, in, in the Justice for Black Farmers Act, we have a lot of specific reforms in USDA in terms of creating a civil rights oversight board that, you know, if someone has a civil rights complaint and they're not satisfied with sort of the process in, you know, that they get within USDA, 
creating an equity commission to sort of look at discrimination throughout the sort of rules and program. And I think really what we were tasking both the oversight board and the equity commission to do was to sort of really look at the county committees, try to see what's the current status of sort of how those committees are operating and what reforms can we put in place and what type of oversight. And look, there are calls from some of the advocates that we should abolish the county committee system, but then the question will become, what are we gonna replace it with, right? Because we don't wanna just centralize everything to Washington. There is value to having, right, this sort of decentralized structure. So it's a really complicated question. I think the first thing we need to do is really focus on it and not ignore it and try to figure out ways to, to make sure that, um, that the way that some of those offices have operated in the past is not what continues to happen. I can help answer that. Um, county committee is something that I think a lot about, especially because it's a place where our young farmers are so deterred from. Every year when elections for county committees come out, USDA asked me to do a reach to our young farmers. I don't think I have a recruited more than one because they are so deterred, so disappointed, so know the baggage that Adam was talking about, that you know about how it, work, how it works, it may not working for them. So I, this is something I also, we wanna think about a little bit more as we think about the Farm Bill because it's in the power of the Farm Bill to restructure uh, county committees and how this is done. One of the things that we have brainstormed aside obviously from abolition of the county committees, but as Adam said, that's, that will have downsides. Uh, it's still a little bit do of what we had done with Young Farmers for a Policy Committee where we have mandatory allocated seats for regional and demographic groups. So we have um, five mandatory BIPOC seats in a federal policy committee. We have mandatory woman seat. We have a mandatory um, LGBTQ representative in the committee. And we also have regional representation. That could be an option. Another option that I imagine in my wildest dream is that the county committee has to match the demographics of the county. Uh, I cannot, if you ever want to look at really sad voting data and election data, don't, don't look at national data, look at county community election data. Uh, because who gets to, who votes on those elections, who gets elected in those elections, who runs to be in county committee is really sad and definitely no representative of agricultural communities. And especially in counties that I know are mostly Hispanic farmers, that are mostly black farmers, that are mostly indigenous farmers. But at the same time, it's again what we said, like, if we, we have county committees who have been historically uh, discriminated and not served white poor communities, how we can expect them to run for these positions? And also understanding that we are asking them for an impossible task. If we were to recruit and ask thousands of white poor farmers and young farmers to serve on this committee, we're asking them to do an impossible task to put themselves in comfortable positions and in comfortable places to advocate. Uh, on behalf of many more. So again, it's a place that we need to be thinking a lot about more. We appreciate you bringing it up, but we definitely need to be, we, we, need, to, we, we need to be put it forward so we can come up with more strategies to address um, the shortcomings of those communities. And just one, one piece to, to add with those, um, with FSA and some of the other ones, it's a policy that was, uh, that was put in place, um, the farm, this past farm bill, which is the receipt for service. Uh, mm -hmm. That was very um, helpful uh, for me, you know, even though trying to get, you know, others to, to, to ask for it, but yet it was um, a struggle because you would go into the office and you would ask for your receipt for service and they didn't know <laughs> what a receipt for service was, was, and you're talking to the people that's in the office. So now you're trying to explain to them, um, I need my receipt for you saying that you're going to service me or that I came in and, and filled out a loan application and that I was number, you know, 23. So I would like a receipt, you know, to, so I could have documentation. So that is, that is great. And I hope that we, that will be able to stay in place, but yet the awareness of it that goes out into the offices to the employees, some of them never heard of it or didn't know. So it was, it was me and another group of, of young farmers explaining because of other organizations, you know, that we were 
taught or just reading to know to get this receipt for service, but the the federal employers they they didn't they didn't know about it. So being able to trickle that information down into those offices was also is something that would help with with the racism, you know, or it would help because not only I don't feel like I'm I, I'm coming in first of all already scared. But yet now I'm telling you something that you think I don't know about, but yet it's it's there that you can that you can give that that I can I supposed to be able to receive. So that would be something just, you know, I think that would open the door of them knowing, you know, what's in place and being able to to just accept what it is that I'm saying and then they are they're able to follow up with it. Great. I we are coming up to our last five minutes of Q and A before we wrap up, and I believe someone else had one more question about FSA, and it looks like our friend Lexi dropped in a little primer on FSA that I think will respond to that question. So be sure to check out that link. And our final question from the audience is for you, Darnella, and Brittany would love to know what are some of the ways. Um, that being in the same pool as larger farmers, uh, as larger farms affects you? Other than, um, I think you mentioned fair pricing and insurance, how else are you being affected by that? I can, so I start <laughs> off by uh, the environment for one, you know, being, I mean, with a large scale farmer and what he's using versus, versus what I'm using. Um, is that's an effect in, in the community uh, that I am versus, you know, being a larger farmer and a smaller farmer, but also marketing, being able to sell, being able to get my produce um, to be sold is, is a big challenge. Uh, the volume that you're asking for that I, that, you know, I'm telling you already what I can provide, or I'm telling you what I already have, but yet you're telling me, well, I need you to supply four states and I just I'm trying to just supply the store or the grocery store that's in my community or just in my area so that is competition and against the the larger farmer that 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 affects tremendously um our farm uh being able to to speak on and I'm sure the list goes on thanks for um, adding some color, though, to some of those challenges that you're facing, I know it's certainly helpful in envisioning how all of this comes together. And with that, we are nearing the end, our final moments here with our wonderful panel. And we'd like to do a couple calls to action for folks to really stay engaged with this topic and have some outline steps for what's next. So I think when it comes to uh, policy. We all know that voting with our vote is really important and that getting in touch with Congress is a really great action. Um, Adam, is there anything else specifically that we could call on folks to do? Yeah, I, th I think sort of two, two things, one of which you just alluded to. I think, you know, on food policy issues, we all have the chance every day with every decision we make, right, when we go shopping just to sort of try to really um, understand where the food that we're buying is coming from and get to know the farmers, right? Like we could either be contributing to this big sort of broken system that we really don't want to perpetuate, or we could be right part of our sort of local regional food system and go, you know, in, in all the different ways that we can. And so I think just trying to, to, to all remember that and do that all the time. And then I think, you know, one big thing for this next farm bill will be, you know, so right now you have Democrats controlling the Senate, Democrats controlling the House that, you know, again, no matter what the farm bill has to be bipartisan, but if we were writing the farm bill today, you know, you'd have um, Chairwoman Stabenow's staff in the Senate and Chairman Scott's staff in the House being the ones with the pen. But after the midterm elections next year, you know, we'll have to see when the dust settles, who's in control of Congress. And so, for, for people that just need another reason to sort of vote in the in the election, the farm bill and, and control of Congress will have a really profound impact on, on what we're able to end up doing to help farmers uh, in the next farm bill. Awesome, thank you for that. 
And what I want to open up to each of our panelists to respond to is how the audience can support your work or get directly involved with your organization. So Vanessa, what about Young Farmers Coalition? I know you mentioned a couple social media links and things. Definitely. It's something that we're definitely mobilizing our members right now is to contact their senators uh, so we can put pressure on passing Build Back Better. Uh, only in Build Back Better, we have around $28 billion in investment for climate smart agriculture. Many of them, we have specific provisions that will go to farmers of color and young farmers. And speci specifically, uh, what we care about is th there's a lot of money now that we're trying to allocate for climate smart agriculture in building a more resilient food system. And a lot of that money, when we get to implementation phase, we can be pleased to serve it to young farmers. But let's make sure like farmers of color also have access because they're really doing a lot of climate smart agriculture and building more resilient food systems. So for us, it's really important that we pass Build Back Better now because that will create the narrative and that will create a lot of incentives about what kind of farm bill we get. If we are able to pass a legislation right now that is really focused on racial equity and climate justice, that sets the tone and the narrative for the farm bill, especially one that will have so much investment as Build Back Better. Uh, I hope Adam agrees with me that we are really excited about Build Back Better and that uh, we see as a, as a as a prototype to the to the next farm bill as uh, many things, um, many investments that could be foreshadowed there. I definitely agree with that. I think I think that you know the the bill is so big and there's so much really important you know climate change provisions and healthcare provision right. There's just so much in this bill that there hasn't been so much focus on what's in here for farmers and and agriculture. But I think it really um, is is a very uh, exciting first step that you know we have to just get it passed and then once we do spend a lot of time talking about it and and making sure people realize how much um, important funding's in there for, for farmers. And just, uh, just to add to, to that, uh, I am glad to be able to, to be a part of this conversation or this platform to, I feel like someone heard what I was saying um, on the ground, you know, here, and I know that someone will reach out and I'm going to reach out. But like I said, in Mississippi and our cooperative is Indian Springs Farmers Association and my small farm, family farm is uh, b, b Farms, which is in Petal, Mississippi. And so just being able to, to be a part of this, this inf information and this platform to give, you know, some of the some of the voices that we have here and for someone to hear and especially um, just to sit here with slow food and, and just know that someone is watching and you never know, you know, that there is help on the way. You all are making my job so easy. Um, this was a really amazing conversation and in order to support more conversations like this and keep our Slow Food Live going, I hope that folks listening will consider becoming a member of Slow Food USA if you're not already. Um, we actually have a Give What You Day, Give What You Can Day coming up um, on the 10th. So any amount of dollars will get you a membership to Slow Food USA. Again, I really just want to thank our wonderful panelists, our fabulous moderator for um a really amazing and informative event and session. I think we have some more questions rolling in on the chat that hopefully we'll be able to address in our notes and when we post the link to our website. I think this in many ways, Adam, as you said, is just the beginning of many conversations and good work to be done. And, um, you know, it's the end of the year. I know it can be a really busy and hectic time. I hope that the winter season is treating each of you well and that all of your holidays are warm and buzzy. Thanks so much for tuning in to our last Slow Food Live of 2021. Thank you, everyone.